Hassan remained calm as the judge read the sentence, death by execution. Josue Flores was murdered last Tuesday on his way home from school. I had a nightmare the other night. It was so real. It just stopped the world from the I told him I was crazy. Officers tell us Trujillo stabbed her boyfriend with stiletto heel shoes. The officer has been shot. We need a lot of light immediately. I have the suspect in custody. Police say the suspect may be responsible for the murders of at least six women whose bodies have been found in or near the Acres Homes area. Defense attorneys had argued that Yates was legally insane and grossly psychotic when she drowned the children. One by one, they described the deaths of the alleged other eight victims of the convicted rail car killer. Welcome back to the Evidence Room, where we're taking a look at some of the Houston area's most notorious criminal cases. Today, we're taking a look back at season one. Some of the cases we featured gained national attention. Others actually changed the way our judicial system works. KPRC2 Investigates is taking you deep into the archives of Harris County criminal court exhibits. We look at evidence like confession tapes, interrogation videos, and crime scene photos. In some cases, even the murder weapons themselves. And the person who watches over all of these exhibits is Harris County Senior Criminal Clerk, Rhonda Spinks. Tell me what's in here. What's not in here? <laughs> uh, you name it. You name it. The only thing, three items I do not receive from the courts are guns, drugs, and live ammo. My name is Rhonda Spinks. I am the senior criminal exhibit clerk for the Harris County District Clerk's Office. This room contains all the exhibits from both misdemeanor and felony courts. It's all cases. Misdemeanor, felony, felony capitals, everything, anything that is submitted as an exhibit to the court reporter. What happens is, I schedule appointments with the court reporters and I go downtown to their offices and they turn them, they, sub, they submit them to me and then I bring them back here and start processing them. Every single one of them. <laughs> I had a case one time, a court reporter turned into me and when I'm going through the photographs, I'm not looking at the photograph really, I'm just looking for the exhibit number because if I looked at every photograph, it would take forever. So I'm flipping through, I'd stick, you know, flip over a stack flip through. Well, I just happened to flip over in the next photograph. I look down and I'm like, where's the man's head? Oh, it's in the Walmart bag there by his body. I mean, you got some weird stuff in this room. You got machetes, you got mannequins, you got swords, you got pipe bombs. Car doors, pipe bombs that I didn't even know I had. That's what I'm saying. I don't know half the stuff that's in this room because who has the time to go through all these boxes? Each case is different. They're the same, but different at the same time, if that makes any sense. A murder is a murder, but how they were murdered is, you know, the stuff you receive. Some of that evidence comes in the form of candy. Every Halloween, parents check their children's Halloween candy to make sure nothing's been tampered with. You probably don't realize it, but that fear goes all the way back to a man by the name of Ronald Clark O'Brien, who was nicknamed the Candy Man. O'Brien killed his own son with a pixie stick. This is the Pasadena neighborhood where Jimmy Bates and Ron O'Brien took their four children trick-or-treating back in Halloween of 1974. There were four children, Kimberly Bates and Elizabeth O'Brien, and the two boys, Timmy O'Brien and his best friend, Mark. O'Brien another father, 
O'Brien's two children and that other father's two children all go out trick-or-treating in this neighborhood. I, of course, won't ever forget it. Jimmy Bates was betrayed by Ronald Clark O'Brien. Bates said that before Halloween, O'Brien asked if he could bring his children over to trick-or-treat with the Bates children on Halloween night. Both families ate dinner together, and then the fathers took the children trick-or-treating. At the time, it was a newer neighborhood. In fact, by today's geography, it's north of Red Bluff Road, right off of Beltway 8. Beltway wasn't even around. Really? Back in so it was, okay, so that really puts it in perspective. After they're finished trick-or-treating, all four children were given pixie sticks laced with cyanide. A fifth child was given a poison stick at the Bates house. O'Brien takes his kids home. His daughter is tired. She's younger. He sends her to bed. Tim, O'Brien's little boy, really wanted the pixie stick. This big old pixie, so his, that's when his dad opened it. And you remember pixie sticks, the yeah, straws, they've yeah, got the different colored yeah, children. Yeah, and they're, they're even bigger nowadays. Right, exactly. So O'Brien's at home with his two children. Each one has a pixie stick, and the little boy wants to eat his pixie stick. So O'Brien helps him open it, helps him actually break it up and pours it into his mouth. And Tim's and, his kid. Yeah, Tim's, Tim is O'Brien's son, eight-year-old son. He was a very active child, almost hyper, and really a sweet kid. Jimmy Bates remembers Timmy O'Brien. His own son, Mark, and Timmy were both third graders at Carpenter Elementary School. And so, according to the court documents and the prosecutors, almost instantly after Tim starts ingesting the sugar from the pixie stick, he starts convulsing, his stomach is killing him, and, I mean, it's, it's horrible. That really gets into how this story happened and how O'Brien got caught. How long did it take police to start suspecting O'Brien? Oh, only within a couple of days. I mean, but you've got to remember, at first, this was like a massive shock to the Houston area and nationally. This went national because everybody's hearing there's this little boy poisoned. Not only that, there were other poison pixie sticks out there. Remember, really? O'Brien gave one to each of his children, so that's two. He gave one to the two friends, so that's four. And then there was a fifth boy. A what? fifth boy actually came over later, and O'Brien gave him the fifth pixie stick. They couldn't account for that one at first. So now, you know, you get these news reports. So it was a full-on panic, and it went, it went national. Kind of put me in the frame of how O'Brien was during that time frame. Like, was he hysterical? Did he know? Like, what's... But this was an interesting point. You know how sometimes something strikes you as odd at the moment, but you don't really know why until later? So at the hospital, O'Brien, like he's beating his hands against the wall. Oh my God, please God, don't take my son. No, not my son, everything. The doctors actually got worried that he may have been poisoned too. And so they lay him down on the gurney and they're like, okay, we, we may need to pump your stomach. And almost instantly, it was like a light switch. He went, no, no, I'm good, I'm good, thanks. You think it kind of left a mark on us. Well, Vic Driscoll was here when all that was happening and he remembers vividly what the city was like. It raised the, the prospect of, of something unknown out, out there that you, you couldn't quite see and identify and, and defend against. So it was a faceless, nameless child killer was on right. the prowl in Houston. Right. So the pixie sticks, one of the things that came out during the trial is pixie sticks are heat sealed. But yet the pixie sticks that had been given to each of the kids had been folded and stapled shut. And O'Brien had actually bragged to people about this brand new pocket stapler that he had got. And then when they search the house, they find scissors in a knife that had traces of the pixie stick sugar on the edges. So when I say, as a career criminal, this guy flunks out of kindergarten, it's these things. And then of course, the ultimate thing was the insurance problem. Police found out that about three, four weeks before Tim was murdered, O'Brien had increased the amount of life insurance he had on his two children and decreased the amount of life insurance he had for himself and his wife. You probably don't realize it, but you've heard of this story in some form or fashion. It's gotten changed over the years and all. You probably don't know the name Ronald Clark O'Brien, but this is again one of the reasons you have to check your candy and why there's that somewhat fear in the back of every parent's mind when their kids go out trick-or-treating. O'Brien was executed and never admitted to killing his own son and trying to kill four other children that Halloween. Police say it was just dumb luck those other children didn't eat their candy. Sadly, Houston has had two killers nicknamed the Candy Man. Before O'Brien's case came to light, there was Dean Coral. He and his family operated a candy store in Houston for years. Coral 
was linked to 28 murders. He was eventually killed himself by his apprentice, Elmer Wayne Henley. We're going to tell you about those murders coming up in season two of the evidence room. Now let's turn our attention to one of the most talked about cases in Houston. That's Carla Faye Tucker. She was only the second woman ever executed in the state of Texas. What was supposed to be a simple burglary ended with two people being hacked to death with a pickaxe. I saw them pictures. I, I tell you, it seemed like it could have been done later. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It was really unbelievable. It was, it was, I'd never seen anything that terrible, and I'd, I worked at Homicide Division about seven, eight years and saw a lot of evil things being done, but never anything quite like this. So you've got Carla Faye Tucker, and I guess what you call her boyfriend, Danny Garrett at the time? Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, goes yeah, over they to- They were going together. Jeff, Jeffrey Dean's apartment to what, why? They were mad at, at uh, him for something he had done, either something he had said about him or something that they, he had done to them. And when, uh, as Carla told me, she got so messed up on drugs that night, she just said, I'm gonna go over there and kick his ass. It was a freak thing. Yeah, please don't. Did y'all take that axe in there? It was already there. Sitting right beside him. In the archives, where all the trial exhibits are, what we're calling the evidence room, the pickaxe is still there. I picked it up. That thing is not a light it's tool. Not. Carla Faye couldn't have weighed more than a buck twenty. She didn't, but I'm going to tell you something. The first thing I heard about Carla from her sister was, JC, do not try to fight with her. She can kick any guy's ass and has done it. Wow. Yeah, because when you pick that thing up, that thing is heavy. Yeah. And yeah. then when you look at both Jeffrey and Deborah were hit multiple times oh, with that yeah. pickaxe. Oh, I, I can't even imagine yeah, the she rage. Finally, she ran out of gas finally. She just she couldn't go any further. Or she would have kept going, but she just finally ran out of gas. You, the, when you talk about evil things that you've seen, I, I looked at the pictures and the actual CSU video was is still there. I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah. The amount, I mean, that's pure rage. Yeah, she would, I mean, that's how... That's how actually crazy Carla had become. Was it the drugs? Drugs mostly, yeah. She was big into drugs. What did you say about that? Is that fingerprints? No. No, I just I seen it in a picture. It had tape on it. I didn't know if they'd stick to tape or not. They won't stick to tape. We had gloves on. Before, though, you said this wasn't your case, you weren't assigned to it, but you wound up getting knee-deep into the case. How did that happen? One of the guys working the case came over and said, hey, we talked to a friend of yours today. And I mean, I know what case they're working, so I'm thinking, what? I said, what are you, who are you talking about? Well, uh, Danny Garrett. He said he was a friend of yours. And I said, yeah, Danny Garrett, hell, he's my bartender. I, he's a, He's a real good friend of mine, yeah, a real good guy. I said, what are y'all talking to him for? Said, well, he may have some information about uh, the case, and, and he's got a brother that's also was uh, uh, hanging around Carla a lot, and this and that. And I knew his brother. Uh, I knew his brother, Doug. Doug was an ex-motorcycle bandito biker. And I knew him for a while before through Danny's wife, who was the girl that grew up in my neighborhood with me. And he called me and he said, yeah, JC, they, they came over and woke us up after the, they had done all this stuff. This is the us. brother? Mm-hmm, the brother. Wait, wait, so Doug. So, say they, so the brother said Carla and Danny came over came after the murders? Afterwards, right afterwards, had all the stolen stuff that they stole, some of the parts and things that were there, and told them what happened. They can't link nothing with nothing. Unless somebody freaks out. They told me that, uh, they told me in these words, y'all are targets. Oh, yeah, they, they told us that. How did you get a brother to wear a wire on his brother? I asked that very question. Are you sure you want to do this to, uh, to Danny? He said, JC, they will come kill us now. Wow. And I have to.
There's one part in there, though, that, I mean, to this day makes me squirm. She said that she basically achieved an orgasm every time she swung the pickaxe and she, landed she it. She told me that. Do you believe that? She told me that. I asked her that same question. While Carla Faye Tucker was on death row, she said she found Christ, and that set up a battle between retribution and redemption. Even the Trinity Broadcasting Network got involved. In the end, Carla Faye Tucker apologized to the families of her victims and said that she hoped her execution would help them find peace. Coming up, more of the best of the Evidence Room season one. We're gonna be talking about a cop killer and a serial killer who called the KPRC2 newsroom to report one of his murders. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Best of Season 1, The Evidence Room, where we're looking at some of the most defining moments in Houston crime. One of those moments involved KPRC2 News. Anthony Allen Shore, who became known as the tourniquet killer for his preferred method of killing his victims, called the KPRC2 tip line, 222-TIPS. At the time, Barbara Magania Robertson was working our assignments desk, and that phone call led to one of Shore's victims. But who, I, did, who did you call? I talked to, crime, it wasn't Crime Stoppers. Crime Stoppers wouldn't give me any time of day. I want to say it was tips. The 222 tips, police mm. news line or something. Whatever it is you call in with tips. Mm. And I changed my voice and I remember telling them where to find her. I remember telling them her name was Ruby. I remember telling them her birthday. Do you, do you remember uh, what you was talking to, a male or female? You call? Honest to God, I don't recall. Okay. I want, I, I want to say female, but I don't okay. recall. He called me and um, he said, I have a tip for you. And I said, okay, well, what's your tip? There's a serial killer on the loose. And I'll be honest with you, at that first you know, initial moment, I was just kind of listening to him half-heartedly um, because I'm trying to do my job. Yeah, and, people and, all the time call us with, I've got the secret to the universe in my back pocket. Uh, yeah. Absolutely, Elvis is at you know the local restaurant. <laughs> I mean, I've had it all. Yeah. And um, so when, you know, I go, okay, so there's a serial killer, is that what you're telling me? He says, yes. And um, I'm gonna tell you where you can find a body. Dana Sanchez. Right. I only got that name from the newspaper. She told me her name was Ruby. I said, okay, well, um, tell me about it. And he said, it's near Ritchie Road. And um, in my mind, Ritchie Road was in Pasadena. Um, and he was not referring to that Ritchie Road. He was referring to Ritchie Road on the north side um, off of I-45. This was like an area that was so overgrown with or trees and bushes. You said where new and, uh, streets were cut or something? Yeah, they looked like they were putting in a new subdivision or something. The but there wasn't anything there, there than just the streets? There just the streets. Okay. He was telling me how it was placed. I couldn't tell you for sure. I'd say probably 100 feet maybe. Off the, road. off the road. What really got my attention was 
halfway through the phone call, he was giving me clues. He was giving me that were unbeknownst to me at the time. He gave me a birth date. He gave me um, he gave me the name of a, a nickname. Um, he gave me a, an identification of a piece of jewelry. I have taken every identifiable thing I could think of. When I went to reach for my key map, uh, things completely changed because um, he said, don't reach for your key map. I knew right then and there he was watching me. I, I can't imagine the feeling that washed over you at that moment. It, that changed the entire course of the conversation because um, what he had just kind of relayed to me in facts, I am now completely tuned in and listening. This is the real deal. The guy's looking at me. Did you it, ask him, are you, where are you, where are you? Did you ask him? No, because I was too busy hiding behind a pole. It was a pillar um, that was on the assignments desk and I rolled my desk, uh, my chair around that. So in my mind, you know, anything for him not to be able to see me. It would take more than 20 years for the families of Shore's four victims to finally see justice. In 2018, Anthony Allen Shore became the first person to be executed in the country. Shore's final words were, ooh wee, I can feel that. Coming up, we're gonna take a look at the oldest prisoner on Texas death row, Carl Wayne Bunchen. It was supposed to be a simple traffic stop in 1990, but for Houston police officer James Irby, it turned fatal. My colleague, Phil Archer, um, veteran journalist, interviewed Bunchen on death row. When Archer interviewed him on death row, he tried to justify the shooting, claiming the officer pulled his gun first. There was no doubt in my mind he was fixing to shoot me. But at the end of the day, still felt it was justified. But at the end of the day, I know it was justified. There was absolutely no evidence ever presented that Irby was threatening his life. Irby was making a traffic stop. Bunchen never tried to claim that he was innocent, that he didn't pull the trigger. His claim was that it was self-defense. I found that an odd claim in a cop killer trial. What was he, what was, how do you try to claim self-defense in something like that? Well, that's just, he's a career criminal. He, he was a liar. And I mean, there was a handful of eyewitnesses to this encounter, I mean. He had nothing to lose, so he th you exactly. throw everything out there and you hope something sticks. He made that claim yeah. two weeks before he was executed. Yeah. That it was self-defense, it was him or Irby. Irby just barely cleared leather with his weapon before he was shot. Bunchen remained on death row for three decades. One of the reasons it took so long for his execution to be carried out is they had to redo the punishment phase of his trial because of faulty instructions given to the first jury. Bunchen was executed in 2022. Our next case had officers retracing the steps of a serial killer and rapist through the Gulf Coast states. At the time, Danny Bible was unknown to law enforcement, but he would eventually become known as the ice pick killer. In 1998, Bible was arrested for trying to rape and kill a woman at a Louisiana motel. At that time though, he started confessing to other murders, some dating back as far as 20 years. Sitting there watching TV and, and drinking he had apparently had an altercation with somebody else staying at this this motel mm -hmm. and whatever reason felt kind of bad went to knock on the guy's door and say hey look sorry for for the dust up so he goes to do that then he drinks some more then he goes back but this time when he goes back to that room there's a woman in the room when the door opened i went right on in and when i turned up i heard this young lady, you know, kind of like startled. Okay. And I uh, pushed her on the bed, and I told her, please be quiet, please be quiet, you know, don't, I, I, you know, I'm not going to hurt you. And pretty much, I guess, like he's done his whole life, he saw her in the urge hit him, and boom, he attacks her. And just, I mean, really, you know, beats her and, and tries to rape her. One of the accounts was he couldn't maintain an erection, which made him even angrier. Oh my so he ties her up, tries to shove her in a duffel bag. She doesn't quite fit in the duffel bag, so that makes him angrier. And through the grace of God, she's finally able to escape. But this whole time, he's like, he's like telling the police, oh, you know, I just told her, I don't want to hurt you. Sorry, I don't want to hurt you. But yet he's tying her up, he's zip-tied her, 
in trying to shove her in a duffel bag. After beating her and attempting to rape her. Correct. Do you know the purpose of why you would be trying to put her in those bags? No, sir. You wouldn't know the purpose of it. No, sir. She, like I said, by the grace of God, gets away. He takes off into the wind. He's finally caught over in Florida for that case. They bring him in, and I guess he just decided to start talking. And so the detectives in West Baton Rouge Parish um, get his confession for what he did at the motel, but then he also confessed to Inez. So if it wasn't for him assaulting that woman, her getting away, him fleeing, and then getting extradited back, mm -hmm. and him just deciding to open up about all this, they would not have known that he killed Inez? No, matter of fact, the, when it finally came out that this guy over in West Baton Rouge Parish had confessed to the murder of Inez Deaton, and we got word of it in, in the media, I remember talking to Captain Don McWilliams with the sheriff's office at the time, because it was a county case, and he said, yeah, we're sending detectives over there immediately because this guy is an unknown to us. I mean, they had zero clue that he had done this. I just want to circle yeah. back. So the reason he got the name the Ice Pit Killer was really just related to his first murder. Actually two. Okay. Um, uh, in the 1983 murders, he used an Ice Pick too. It was there. Both Now, times. it was interesting. They never found the murder weapon. In the first one? In either of the cases. Oh, okay. The, what's in the trial exhibit, the evidence box, is an ice pick, but it was used for demonstration to uh, the jury. So he just said, like, I used the ice pick? Mm -hmm. Well, you could see from the autopsy reports. I mean, it was, it was the, I mean, Inez was stabbed like 11 times. Oh. Yeah, and I mean, you could tell based on the wounds that, you know, he wasn't making up the ice pick mm -hmm. uh, part of it. Wow. Yeah. It wasn't a straight shot to death row. No, because you think about it, you have, 19, you have Inez murdered in 1979. He beats feet out of town after her body is found. In 1983, you have the three people, two, two women and a child, murdered in a single day. He goes to prison for one of those murders, gets out, bounces around, you know, is accused at one point of kidnapping an 11-year-old girl, accused of sexually assaulting family members, I mean, this whole deal. And then it wasn't until 1998 that he was finally caught. So we're talking 19 years from Inez's murder mm -hmm. and 15 years from the murder. Eight, eight of those years he was in prison. That, and that's what just boggles my mind. It's like you, you talked about Inez's murder, which went unsolved, mm -hmm. the three people murdered, the numerous assaults, the alleged kidnapping, Robberies. Robberies, rapes. You don't have to worry about alleged with this guy. You, well, yeah, I yeah. Mean, he's an awful human being. The Harris County Archive contains thousands of pieces of evidence, all represent lives forever altered, and that includes the lives of the first responders to these crimes. Coming up in season two, we're going to be looking at six new cases. One involves a serial killer who was only recently brought to justice. Another involves the deaths of four children at a daycare, a scene that still continues to impact the firefighters that responded more than a decade ago. Here's a preview of what we have in store for season two. When the digging ended, the total was 27 murdered. William Reese is the only suspect in the murders of Jessica Kane, Laura Smither, Kellyanne Cox, and Tiffany Johnston. They got me set up like I'm a serial killer right now. Tata is charged with four counts of manslaughter for this February 24th fire that killed four children. Season two of The Evidence Room begins Wednesday. January 25th at 6.30 p.m. on the KPRC2 Plus app. For the KPRC2 Investigates team, I'm Robert Arnold. See you then.